Um, we have uh, some questions. Again, these are not for like any grade or anything. We're just going to go over them as a reminder for what we've talked about since it's been a while. Our minds are not in the same places anymore. So what immune cell produces granzyme and perforin? Does anybody remember that one? That's going to be a cytotoxic T cell. What is the first type of antibody that will be produced during initial contact with a pathogen? The first one that's gonna be produced is IgM. Which type of antigen is presented on an MHC class two molecule? If it's class two, it came from outside because remember class one looks like an eye, that's inside. That's how we'll distinguish that. So they will be um, exogenous or external, however you wanna look at it. Uh, give one example of the six major functions of antibodies and explain how it works. I think I actually list all of them in the little answer area. So let me get to that next slide. Yeah, I do. Okay. So I actually have for number four, all of them listed. If you are interested in reminding yourself about it, I'll go through them really quick. Uh, the six major functions of antibodies, agglutination, causing things to stick together, right? It's folding on all over the place. Coating, just covering the whole bad guy so it can't do whatever it's trying to do. Neutralization, blocking those docking molecules so that the bad guy can't attach specifically to whatever molecules it attaches to. Um, Antitoxin, um, covering whatever the tiny little toxin is so that it can't be a toxin and do its thing. Opsonization, creating a sort of handle or grip so that the phagocyte has something to grab onto when it's hard for them to do otherwise. And then um, activating the classical um, pathway for complement cascade. So, um, yeah, classical remember complements. That's a chapter fifteen thing, but that was um, classical was antibody triggered, and we had the lectin pathway, and then we had the alternative, which was LPS or endotoxin. Same thing. All right. So, getting into chapter seventeen, this is going to be dealing with what I would say immunopathology. So, when the immune system goes wrong. When it's not behaving the way that it, we want it to or what we think it would be designed to do. So immunopathology is the study of disease states associated with um, overreacting immune responses. Um, and this can lead to allergy, hypersensitivity, autoimmunity, and all sorts of responses like that. We'll also be getting into hyposensitivity whenever your immune system isn't um, able to react the way that it needs to, whether that's genetic or whether that's acquired somehow. In case you can't figure out from me talking about acquired immunodeficiencies, one of those would be AIDS, right? But anyways, so um, our top, in the, in the very top, which, you know, oddly enough, that's the ones we're going to get to the last, but we have our uh, hyposensitivities, underreactions. So primary means that it's something that you have from first. There's some sort of defect in your lymphocyte generation or something like that where you can't make your white blood cells correctly example that they're giving here is the boy in the bubble disease um, correctly that it will be skid is how we would refer to it as severe combined immunodeficiency they have no immune system whatsoever so they have absolutely no way to fight off anything at all so even just the slightest little bug that you would consider normal in your body can kill them they have no way to fight it off literally no way at all so um so they die very early typically um also it's always men it's never women that have this it's because it's X-linked. Um, that means it's on the X chromosome. And I don't know if you guys know this, but women have two X chromosomes, right? So, so yeah, so women have two X chromosomes. So if one of them's messed up, the other one compensates, but men only get one X chromosome. So if it's messed up, it's messed up and that's what they get. So that's why we see it in men and not in women really. The odds of you having two X's that are messed up that way are just, it's like impossible. So um, anyways, obviously, that would leave secondary immunodeficiencies. These are the ones that you acquire later on. This could be something like obvious, like AIDS, right? But it could also be like if you have cancer and that affects your immune system just by having like leukemia or something like that, or even by treating the cancer with chemotherapy, that can also cause something uh, similar. Or even just being exposed to radiation as well. Um, all right, so then we have our hypersensitivities and these are the ones we're gonna get into first and we're gonna go over these as we get to them. So hypersensitivities, we're dealing with overreaction to things that we maybe shouldn't be reacting to at all. You can react, of course, just like anything else in the immune system to things that are exogenous or endogenous, right? Um, so if you're overreacting to something that is endogenous from within your own body, that would be an autoimmune disease. Your body's attacking itself, right? All right. 
uh, the four major categories that we're going to go through. Type one is going to be allergy and anaphylaxis, so there's, they're going to be related there. Type two is going to be cell damage. Now, I'll, I'll say this. Type two is the blood type related ones, and we'll get into what I mean in a moment, but if you've ever heard of Rogam, we're going to be talking about how that works and why it works and why it's so important in a little while. Um, type three, immune complex formation. Um, this is basically like what I think we had brought it up previously about how you have like strep, you can get antibodies that look like your self antibodies and stuff like that. Those antibodies can then stick together as antibodies can sometimes agglutinate, right? Within um, little bits of antigen that they're attacking. And then those clumps of antibody antigen mess can get caught in this tight areas of your body or whatever. One of those really tight areas where it gets real, real uh, narrow will be in um, the vessels in your kidneys where we have exchange of, you know, um, matter, however you want to go, waste versus whatever, and uh, all that. So creation of urine there. But anyways, um, we'll get into that. And then type four is delayed type hypersensitivity. If you have had poison ivy, some of you, if you've had it enough, you've probably noticed that if you get exposed to poison ivy, you don't get the poison ivy rash that same day that you're exposed. It takes a couple of days. This is delayed type hypersensitivity. And it's specifically related to your cell mediated immune system, not the um, antibodies. Everything else on here is antibodies. And we'll talk about that. Um, also, when you guys go get your, uh, well, a lot of you guys are in healthcare. When you go get your PPD uh, tubercul tuberculosis skin test, right? Um, do you get the skin test and then they just wait right there to see if it puffs up? No, you go back in like 48, 72 hours, right? That's usually what it's gonna be. It's about 48 hours because that's a delayed type reaction as well. So that's the type of cells that are going to be involved in that are cell mediated T cells. So we're going to go through them. Don't worry. Um, type one allergic reactions. Uh, really, that's how just I remembered these allergic reactions. And if you remember from uh, chapter whatever it was, the one before this one, 16, if you remember from chapter 16, we talked about the different antibodies and what they are related to, um, to what they do, basically, and whatever parts of the body. So IgE, IgE is related to allergies. And that's really all in like the first world um, that we see it associated with. It's usually associated with like worm infections, parasitic infections, but we don't really have that here. So we see it associated with allergies. So that's IgE. So you're making antibody against things like cat dander and crap like that, which like normal stuff, like you shouldn't be reacting to it, but your body doesn't know what to do with itself. So that's how it's dealing with it. Um, basically. And so once you have seen that thing, remember when you get your vaccines for like the measles, and I've already explained to you guys, like once you've had the measles vaccine and you've been appropriately vaccinated, if I bring somebody in here that has the measles, your body reacts so quickly with antibody response that it had from its memory um, that you don't even know that your body saw the virus, right? It's the same thing with allergies, except this time it's IgE and it's against not measles, right? It's against cat dander or whatever. So you react right away the second that you see it with this production of IgE. It just happens to be the type of antibody associated with this sort of reaction. So um, yeah, so that's how basically how this is gonna work and how that's gonna lead to just wonderful allergies. I'm sure all of us probably have at least an allergy to something. Um, there's two different kinds of allergies we can be dealing with. Uh, one of them we already talked about a little bit, well, I guess we mentioned it, anaphylaxis. Most of us know what that is, right? It's a systemic reaction. The whole body is having a reaction against something. And it is an allergic reaction, but it's just all over. When you have it locally, then that's called atopy. Or you can say atopic, right? You've heard of atopic dermatitis or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's atopic reactions. They're going to be local. Even um, hay fever in your sinuses or even in your lungs, those are still localized. As long as it's not systemic, we would still consider it to be an atopic reaction. So that's why we consider asthma to fall in that category. Um, eczema, for example. Eczema falls into this. It's going to be atopic dermatitis, um, but you have it kind of all over your skin, but it's not systemic, right? You're not having that reaction everywhere in your body. It's just going to be related to your skin, sometimes your eyes as well. So the idea is that our immune system needs to be trained by interaction with microbes as we develop. So either through vaccination, as we're so used to in this modern day and age, 
or by seeing these things as we're going up, our body says, this is a bad thing that we need to be able to react to. And this is how we react to it. Without that training being exposed to certain things, it's like our body didn't get told which things are bad and which things are, are friendly in this whole arena, the IgE arena, because we don't have, you know, worms and parasites and all of that. So we didn't get trained properly. That's the idea. Um, and then that's why we're so sensitive to uh, just random things, just random sort of stuff. Um, also, our whole life in general, other than not being exposed to worms and everything, as this is getting to, our lives are clean. So we're just not exposed to as much as we would be if we weren't, you know, modern humans, right? So like it says, um, delivery by C-section, you're being exposed to um, less bacteria than you would be if you were born vaginally, for example. All right. Um, so we're going to uh, classify our allergens based on how they're going to be getting into your body. Uh, our inhalants, ingestants, injectants, and contactants. So contact. There. Um, these are not crazy. This is exactly what you would think they would be. So nothing nuts about these. Inhalants would be pollen, dust, mold, dander, animal hair, um, uh, insect parts, formalin, anything that you would inhale and like get like that itchy um, sort of throat feeling like you would get. You're allergic to these. Um, ingestants, things that you get from eating or, or swallowing like drugs like you have with penicillin. Um, injectants means that it's literally injected to the body somehow, naturally or otherwise. So if you're allergic to a vaccine or bee stings, they're injecting venom into you. So that counts as an injectant. Um, and then contactants, just things that you would be allergic to if you touch them. Some of these two, some of them involve both this type of allergy, IgE-based type one hypersensitivities, as well as the delayed type, because you can have delayed type sensitivities associated with metals as well. Um, so you can wear a necklace that has like nickel in it or something, and then a couple days later get a rash on your neck or something. And then you might not even know what necklace it was that did it because it was a couple of days ago and, and people don't always know to think about that. But anyways, that sort of stuff, um, it can have a combination of, of things going on. Depends on how your body reacted to it, right? Um, all right. This is how allergies are going to go. I told you guys we don't need to know much about mast cells. This is pretty much all we are ever going to talk about a mast cell. This is the only reason I brought it up in the first place in chapter 15. So um, here, basically, you have your initial dose of whatever your allergen, allergen is. Let's say it's cat, you know, dander. I'm allergic to cat, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, lymphatic vessel carries the allergy allergen to the lymph node, we get the presentation thing going, we make antibodies against it, that's IgE, and then IgE sticks its little bottom to the, uh, the mast cell and acts like a receptor on a mast cell. So it has the ability to hold on to whatever IgE happens to be in the area and use it like a receptor. And if you encounter antigen, then it releases its contents. And that's what's going on here. We see the allergen again later. We've got this mast cell with all this IgE on it. It interacts here. And then now we're going to release our contents. And what are its contents? I bet you guys will be able to uh, guess what it's going to be. Histamine, serotonin, leukotriene, platelet-activating factor, prostaglandins, and bradykinin. All of these are going to be affecting vasodilation and things like this. Not surprising, especially if you have severe allergies and you're having, um, you know, bronchoconstriction and things like this, these are triggered by these types of like hormone response, um, chemicals, mediators, whatever you want to call them. But we know histamine for sure. We know histamine. That's why we take antihistamines in response to allergen, allergens of some whatever kind. So here's kind of a, a breakdown of the effects that these things can have on us. Like when we start having prostaglandin, that's going to constrict your bronchioles. It's going to dilate your blood vessels. Um, affects your nerve cells and leads to headache. Um, then we have histamine, serotonin, and bradykinin, increased blood flow. Um, we'll have skin manifestations like hives, uh, dilated blood vessels here. Uh, peristalsis of the intestine can lead to diarrhea and vomiting in some cases, especially if you're dealing with um, you know, something that you've eaten. Uh, secretory glands, this is why you get runny nose and everything like that. And then we have um, leukotriene, again, more constriction of the bronchioles and mucus buildup, so you're having a hard time breathing. Okay. All righty. 
Let's go through some examples. Hay fever. Hay fever is also known as allergic rhinitis. You guys know rhine means nose, yeah? That's not a tricky thing here. So we're having issues with our nose rhinitis, uh, gonna be inflammation of the nose. This is allergic rhinitis. You can also have like, a, you know, a cold, which would not be allergic rhinitis, but it could be rhinitis, right? Um, and like a inflammatory rhinitis caused by viral infections and things like that. But when it's allergic, then obviously we know it's gonna be a hay fever due to something you're inhaling, um, at airborne allergens, it could be seasonal or it could be like animal dander or something. Um, then we have asthma where we have bronchoconstriction affecting our ability to breathe as our reaction against our exposure to something. Um, eczema is atopic dermatitis. So again, this is still a local infection, even though you will see infection, not infection, but a local reaction, even though we see it all over the body, it's not in the organs. It's not affecting the lungs here. It's just going to be associated with the skin. It's awful and it's uncomfortable, but, um, and it can be quite severe as we can see here in these images, but it can be controlled through medication and um, through allergy treatments. And then we have food allergies, um, usually peanuts, fish, cow's milk, wheat, eggs, shellfish, and soybeans, um, where you'll have vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. You can also have eczema, hives, rhinitis, uh, asthma, and occasional anaphylaxis associated with these. We know this is the case, especially if you've seen like with, with shellfish, like people getting their faces swelling up and then they start to not be able to breathe and that sort of stuff that is anaphylaxis, right? It's going to be systemic. Um, what do I want to say? Sometimes you can have food allergies that don't have hives or any of this, but a lot of us are used to seeing that sort of outward presentation of things like you see with peanut allergies and all that, the face that uh, swelling up and redness and all, and all like hives, everything like that. But that doesn't always have to happen in food allergies, just depends on the person and the allergen. So sometimes you'll just have GI symptoms. You might not think it is an allergy, but it could in fact be. Um, you could, in, in fact, have all these stomach pains and not even know what's causing your stomach pain until finally you can't take it anymore. Maybe you end up in the ER a couple times and they finally did a colonoscopy and then they find out like you have irritation in your stomach. And then a lot of times they can tell just by looking at it that it's a food allergy. Well, then what, right? How do you know what food it is? Like you're not, you're going to assume maybe it would be peanuts, fish or whatever, but like it's probably not because you probably would have known by then. So then what do you do? You have to go through the testing, right? With the all those little pricks on the back or whatever it is. So, I don't know, good times, uh, but yeah. All right, uh, drug allergies, most of the time it's gonna be penicillin, but it can also be sulfa drugs, um, which are synthetic. You, know, you can also have allergies to aspirin and opiates. If you're allergic to aspirin, you're probably aller allergic to any of those salicylates. So salicylic acid and everything like that, they're related to aspirin. You can be allergic to opiates, so you wouldn't be able to take any opiate-derived uh, pain medications. Um, all right, so if we have systemic anaphylaxis, whether it's like from eating shellfish or a lot of times what we see with bee stings, if you've ever seen My Girl, this is exactly what was happening with Macaulay Culkin's character. Uh, but we had injection of the venom of the bee and then a uh, reaction to it systemically over the entire body. Um, but yeah. This can happen, as it says, injections of certain antibiotics. If you're allergic to penicillin, you get an injection of penicillin, and that's your first like exposure to it. You never knew you were allergic before. That can be a big problem, right? Uh, and then uh, maybe administering certain types of serum if we're trying to treat other aspects of you know whatever diseases you can have. So, anyways, um, the sensitivity to this can last for a long, long time. The IgE that is bound up to those mast cells can hang around for like decades, basically afterwards. So um, we want to do some um, uh, treatments based or, or carry around your EpiPen, right, in order to treat that sort of reaction. But how can we test to determine um, what kind of allergies you might have? So there's different versions. We have the in vivo method where we're going to be testing this like on your back, making little injections in little spots and seeing if it welts up um, in reaction to the fat. And then we can basically get a map on your arms or your back, whatever, however many we're testing, right? So it only doesn't take very long if you've already been exposed to the thing and you're already allergic. It only takes like 15 minutes to see the welts coming up as long as it's IgE related. Um, so anti-allergy medication wants to block the progress of allergic responses um, between IgE um, and whatever uh, chemical mediators are being produced by basically the mast cells, right? So that, to stop that whole process somehow. 
um, we can inhibit the activity of lymphocytes and their production of IgE in the first place. So remember the B cells are the ones that are gonna be producing the IgE, even though now after that, it's gonna be an innate response related to it. But um, yeah, you don't wanna, you don't wanna take antihistamines and medications like that for too long because you're meant to have, it's blocking your whole of your immune system, right? You're not just blocking that one allergy based thing, you're blocking your entire immune system by taking that. So there's a reason that it exists. So you don't wanna take it long-term, take it whenever you're having the symptoms, but don't be trying to take like Benadryl long-term. Um, anyways, let's see, let's see, let's see. Antihistamines obviously are going to block the histamine aspect. Then we have epinephrine or adrenaline, same thing, okay guys? Epinephrine and adrenaline are gonna be the same thing for our purposes. Um, if you have anaphylactic attacks, this is the best way to counteract that. It is not a cure. It, like it says on the slide, it has a very short half-life. You take your EpiPen, you pop it and shove it into your leg and, and, and compress it down, right? And it injects you with the epinephrine or adrenaline, whatever. And um, now, yeah, your, your symptoms will start relieving right away because right away in your bloodstream, now you're getting more um, uh, air to your lungs as that bronchoconstriction is relieved or bronchodilating now. Um, and that's great. And that's great. But it's like I said, short lived. So if you do have to use an EpiPen, you better be heading to a hospital as soon as you use it because it will wear off um, depending, it depends on your metabolism and what, you know, is going on at the time. But it can be a very short lived um, experience. So you want to go to the hospital to get treated for whatever it is that's triggering your anaphylaxis if you are having to use an EpiPen. All right. Um, how do we, can we de desensitize? I'm sure that you guys have heard that you can like get treatments to get rid of allergies. Yeah. So this is an, um, unheard of. Basically all we're going to be doing is uh, exposing somebody to whatever their allergy is allergen is with certain like trigger molecules to get them to react differently. So what the idea is, is if I'm allergic to cat dander um, and then I go to the doctor and I get these shots or like you can get this like through the freaking mail nowadays. But um, anyways, you get these shots and you give yourself these shots to expose yourself to a little bit of cat dander, but you also have some chemicals with it. And the chemicals aren't anything nasty. What they are is there to trigger IgG production. Because we remember IgG, that's the big daddy of all of the antibodies, right? It's the one that's the most effective. It's made in spades. Like it's going to be there, right? Like 80% of your antibody response when you respond to something should be IgG um, typically. So what we're doing, trying to do is trigger that response, create that response. Because if IgG can be made in response to cat dander, it will get rid of all of the cat dander before IgE even has a chance to react to it. So there's no chance that that IgE is going to even ramp. So it blocks that whole pathway just by eliminating the allergen just because IgG is so effective at its job. So that's the idea of how that would work. This is just showing some pictures of it. I don't know why there's a bread in this, but it's okay, I guess. <laughs> there's a bread here. I guess if people, I don't know what's going on. But anyways, <laughs> that's the idea. You're going to be um, trying to block uh, that with the uh, making antibody IgG. So that's down here in this category. We have, of course, avoiding the allergen, duh, right? Um, and then blocking events. So this is what we're talking about with taking antihistamines, which would be the late parts of it. We have um, other antibodies to block the IgE itself, not the antigen, but the IgE, um, which is tricky. And then we have um, steroids. I'm sure you guys have heard of steroids helping with things like allergies. Um, that shuts down IgE production, but it shuts down all antibody production. So that's why we can't take these things long-term. But that's how it would work if you need to treat it temporarily. Number three is of course the best route to go if you wanna get desensitized to whatever it is, but it's not available. It's not gonna work for every allergen, unfortunately. All right, let's move on to type two. Type two deals with the blood types. So starting off with talking about uh, blood in general, Red blood cells, they have alloantigens that we have to consider when we're giving blood to somebody. It's like what whenever you go to donate blood and they tell you what your blood type is, A, B, A, B, or O. That's the possibilities, right? Other than the positive or the negatives, which we'll get to in a moment. But just the A, B, A, B, and O. So those are the four blood types that you could possibly have. 
Um, and they just have to deal with sugars on the coating of your red cells. That's it. Just what kind of sugar do you have or do you even have a sugar? This isn't just determined by like one gene that you have. Um, if you have a blood type, so I'm a I'm an A blood type, by the way. So I have type A blood. And my choices would be uh, I had a gene from my mom that was A and a gene from my dad that was A, or a gene from mom that was A and a gene from, from my dad that was O. But that A, because it is going to code for sugar A, that will, will get seen, it'll get expressed. Now, why is O not being seen? Why is it not being expressed over A? Because O is the base. It's not anything. It's like the base everything was built off of. Everybody has that in their structure, okay? So O is like the nothing one, right? That is why with O, when they tell you like the universal donors, O is the universal donor because everybody has that base. Anybody can receive that. That doesn't look weird to anybody. Everybody has that foundation. So O is the foundation part, okay? So you can have a gene for O and a gene for A, and that means you have some expression of A, which means you are an A blood type, right? I'll get to why this is important in a moment, um, but basically, um, and also you can think about it this way. So I'm an A, right? Uh, my dad is a B, the B positive, and my sister's an AB. So what does that make my mom? My mom's never been tested. She has to be an A. Right, because my dad doesn't even have the A gene. And if you have A and B at the same time, they're both expressed equally. So you have A and B. So that's the unique thing going on. So my dad's B, he had to carry the B and the O. That's why I get to be A. So he couldn't carry A or else he would have been A B. So I have to be A O. Um, assuming, assuming this everything worked out right, like assuming there wasn't any sort of weird milkman situation or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, but here's the idea. We'll go through this a little, a little bit of a chart here. If you have blood type A, right, and the only genes that you have are A and maybe O hanging out that doesn't count really for anything, right? So you have A. The things on the surface of your cell is going to be A. Straightforward, right? Um, that means you automatically have anti-B antibodies. To you, B looks foreign your body would see B automatically as foreign and it will make antibody automatically that way. It's just genetically part of your blood type. So I'm an A, so I know I have anti-B antibodies. Interesting, right? Since my dad was a B, but that's just the way it works. It's the way the cookie, cr cookie so crumbles. You, your dog, blood type? My sister has AB. Okay. Yeah. So she got the B from my dad. Okay, so it's just trying to get it from milk? Yeah, okay. yes. So genes like that, that's a good question. So that's a genetics type of a question. But yeah, um, that tends to be pretty random. Pretty random yeah. They'd say if you have, like my dad would have a B and an O, right? And so which one would I be getting? It is literally 50-50 is how they would say that would be. So 50-50 chance. So I got the O and my sister got the B. She could have had O, we would have said this still would have been 50-50 for her, but yeah, yeah. Um, she's the lucky one though. She's AB positive, which means she's the universal recipient. So she can get any type of blood at all. Yeah. So nice. Must be nice. <laughs> um, anyways. So yeah, same thing with B. We'll just go through it. But like B would be a blood type. You have B on your surface. So you see A as weird. So you have anti-A antibodies. So I cannot give you, if you are a B, like my dad is, he can't receive my blood as an A, right? because his body sees A as weird. It has antibodies against my blood. Same thing, vice versa, right? I can't get his blood because he's a B. So I can't get his, you know, he's a B positive. I can't get B positive blood because my body automatically sees B as foreign. That's the difference here. So what happens? So whatever, so we, we have A, B, let's just go to, my sister's name is Erica. Let's go, let's go to Erica's blood type. <laughs> like you guys know who I'm talking about, but, um, yeah, so she has, my sister has um, A, B blood type. So she has A and B on her surface. So to her, B looks normal and A looks normal and O looks normal because that's our base for everything. So she can get anything. That's why we say that as a, a universal recipient. Um, o has doesn't have A or B on its surface. So those cells don't have any A or B markers, right? 
So that's great. So we have these cells that don't have A or B on them. They just have the foundation everybody knows. We can give that to anybody, right? Anybody can receive it. So universal donor. However, they see A and B as foreign. So they have antibodies against both. Yes. Yeah, so they can only have O. So when you think about that and you're like, oh, well, you know, when somebody is going to get in an accident, we're going to give them O negative. And a lot of people know that, right? O negative because that's the universal donor. Anybody can get O negative. It doesn't have any marker that's distinctive about it. Everybody can see it. But what happens when somebody who's O negative comes in? They can only receive O negative. So if you use that up on a big trauma, assuming that you weren't going to see somebody who's O negative and somebody else comes in that is O negative, all they can get is O negative. So you're going to have to call OBI or whoever to come get, you know, blood, to come give the blood to the, um, you know, Baptist or whoever. Um, to bring it down there. And then you have to cross test it and all of that before you can even give it to somebody. So there's a big process involved. How long is uh, my 30 minutes, probably. What's the question? So RH is a whole other marker. So with A, B, and O, all we're dealing with is those. And then there's RH factor, which is positive or negative. So you either have it or you don't have it. So that's that symbol. So um, you can be A, B, or O. And then you can be RH positive or negative. So I'm A positive, so I'm RH positive. And I have A. If you're A positive, can you get, a, like, can you get negative or positive? Or yes, so positive? negative is exactly like what we say with O. Negative is the same thing. It's like the foundation, yeah. So you don't react to it then. Which is, we're gonna get into that in a second too with um, the, the babies, right? With Rogan and all that. So here's a picture of the sugars in case you're interested and how basically it's gonna work. But you can see here type O, this is what I mean. It's got this common portion, the foundation, how I like to say it, but they all have that. So O is going to be good for anybody. All right. Um, we test blood. Uh, a lot of times whenever you're testing blood nowadays, we do it a little bit differently. But the base, basic idea is I mix antibodies that are anti-A and I mix your blood. And if it clumps together from them sticking and agglutinating, then that means you have A. And that's essentially how that would be working. But I'm not going to test you guys over this, but that's how they would look to see what blood type you have. Um, for transfusions, um, like we said, type O, it doesn't have A or B. Anybody can get it. It's a universal donor. If you are an AB person, you don't have any antibodies to A, to O, to B. So you can get anything. So that's why those work the way that they do. All right. Um, what happens, right, this is what we're going to get to. What happens if you do transfuse the wrong blood type? So if um, my dad was at the hospital with me after I had a massive accident, and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm B positive, so, so is she. He's just assuming, and I'm not, right, I'm A. And they uh, transfused me with a B positive. What happens? My body will literally attack with those um, antibodies, like we said. So that's the whole thing. You have anti-B antibodies, right? So I will crank out anti-B antibodies and activate the complement pathway, which is always there in your bloodstream. Start killing all of those red blood cells that you're putting into the body. Now, I don't know if you know this, but your body can't really handle a whole lot of that all at once. But when your body's seeing all this foreign blood cells coming in and it's breaking them down, it's going to put your body into shock because it's realizing that we have all this breakdown of cells. It doesn't know that it's not your cells, but it sees all this damage going on. So systemic shock. And um, kidney failure because the kidneys don't know how to process all this breakdown of broken, you know, red blood cells being degraded by a complement pathway and other stuff like that. So um, easily you can die from this, easily, especially if you get a couple units um, pumped into you all at once. So yeah, it says death is a common outcome, and that is definitely true. Um, that's kind of why we have to be so careful about it. So even when OBI does bring uh, blood to Baptist, and that's how it is, right? So OBI is the sole contributor of blood to Integris system. Um, to Mercy and stuff too, they're not the only ones, but if they call OBI and then say, we need, you know, 10 units of ONEG, then they will, you know, pack it up and then bring it out to Baptist and then their um, blood bank workers, they usually have two at least minimum working at all times. But um, they'll go ahead and get it immediately and start testing a little bit. There's like a little bit, they'll be in like one of the little hoses, I say hoses, I don't know what to call them, the lines in there um, that they'll test it to see what blood type it is because they don't trust OBI. 
And they shouldn't because, <laughs> and they shouldn't because one happened one time. So one time, this is very recent one actually, um, in the last year for sure. There was a lab worker who mislabeled the blood products. And so it got delivered to Baptist and Baptist, I think it was Baptist, tested it and said, this is testing as, you know, O positive and you're trying to give it to me as O negative. And that's a big difference. And um, they, that was a big problem. So I, I don't know, things like that happen because we have to have people doing certain parts of their jobs that machines can't always do that unfortunately there's human error sometimes. And so that's what happened there, but that's why we double check. Nobody got, you know, given the wrong blood. Um, yeah, but there are checkpoints for this for a reason, right? All right, so let's move on to RH. So that's the ABO part of things. You can be A, you can be B, you can be AB, you can be O, the four blood types. You can also be positive or negative. So if I'm A positive, that means I'm positive for the RH factor. This is the rhesus factor. That's what it stands for. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to test you on it, but that just testing, you know, blood cells of monkeys, that's how they discovered it, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, so you can be RH positive or RH negative. Um, RH positive, dominant, just like the AB and that sort of stuff. Um, recessive is going to be like the O. So anybody can get negative. Um, okay, so with RH. So that's all that's time to talk about. So whether or not you have the marker or you don't have a marker, that's all RH is looking for. You have RH group. So let's say we have an RH negative mother. She's RH negative. She's never seen RH positive in her body, in her bloodstream or anything like that. To her, positive looks foreign, right? She has a mark that, to her, positive has a marker that looks like it doesn't belong. So what happens is if she has RH negative babies only, her body is fine. She doesn't need any special attention, whatever, because that's all normal. That looks normal to her. Her body, however, the first time she has an RH positive fetus, her body will start building up antibodies to RH positive. Now, the first time that you're pregnant, this isn't a huge deal because you don't build your blood cells until later on in the pregnancy. And um, the time that it takes for your body to build up antibodies against this, it takes time. So typically you may have built up the antibodies by the end of the pregnancy, but there would be no evidence of any attacking or anything like that, right? Okay, but we all know that once you have antibodies made against the foreign thing, the second time that you see it, it's not gonna take so long, right? It's gonna be quick. So as soon as that baby has antigens that are available for the mother to um, interact with that RH positive, the second RH positive that they're having, then she'll attack the baby's blood, um, just like we would attack the transfusions. And that can easily lead to babies dying. And if you think this isn't something that actually goes on, that everybody who is RH negative always gets their Rogam and everything's gonna be fine, this Rogam is what we give in order to counteract all of this. Well, that's not true. I have had people in my classes in the past who have said that they knew people who their babies were born stillborn because of this. It turned out that this was the issue. They just didn't know it. Maybe you moved and you got a new doctor and your old doctor just didn't tell you about it or something like that. It's that simple. Um, you just might not know. And it's unfortunate. But um, for those who are aware of it, there is Rogam. So it is anti-RH um, immunoglobulins. So basically blocking the interaction with the mother's antibodies so that it can work, yes. Would you get a shot every time as a preventative just in case? Yes, okay. yeah. Yeah. So the once and done shot or do you have to do it over again? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know enough about it. Can you get the once and done? Yeah, I feel like it's early, like mid-pregnancy or something, yeah. they'll have you come in. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah. Close to 20 weeks, I think, you should get it. Yeah, because I think that they- Pretty healthy shot too, is that it? Or is it I don't know. I'm not actually, I don't know enough about it. I've never been pregnant. I don't know about any of this. So this is a, not a question for me, but definitely, <laughs> definitely if you guys learn about it, I would like to know about it. Um, but yeah, so that's that. That's all of type two. So that's why I say type two, just think of it as the blood ones, right? So those are all going to be, um, I believe IG, IgG related. Yes. Anyways, so type three is immune complexes. Like I said, 
this is going to, you have a large dose of antigen. So let's say you have strep and, um, and like we've already said about anaphylaxis requires a very small dose, just like a bee can sting you and you can go into anaphylactic shock. But here you're gonna have a lot of antigen present and you're gonna have antibody building up with it. And then these complexes are gonna get stuck in certain areas of the body. So antibody combines with antigen, um, it creates these complexes that look a lot like this. The blue is the antigen, and obviously the purple is the antibody. Um, these can, normally this is good. It'll help uh, create, you know, prevention of infection and help fighting infection, all of this, but it's not that good if we get stuck in the basement membrane of cells. And there might be small enough to get stuck there. And then the neutrophils come along and they recognize that as foreign, like this is attack happening. Somebody's attacking right here. Antibodies building up right here. We need to really, you know, uh, release our, you know, granules and all this to fight this, but it's actually just fighting your own cells because it doesn't realize that it's just leftover stuff from another um, situation. So um, when I tell you guys that these things are going to get stuck in the basement membrane, it's going to get lodged in like really tight locations, like your joints, okay? Like your joints, and then your neutrophils might go there and start attacking in those joints or might be in capillaries, especially the thin capillaries in, in the face. So you might have attacking in the capillaries of the face. If this doesn't sound like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, I don't know what to tell you guys, because that's exactly what happens in those um, autoimmune diseases. This isn't the only reaction that happens in those autoimmune diseases, but these are defining features. All right, so that's how that works. Um, the example that we have that is, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna ask about it on the test. I can't always say this word, so bear with me. Acute post streptococcal, glomerulonephritis, I did it, all right? And um, <laughs> and this is essentially your kidneys having that happen in the kidneys as a result of having a strep infection. So anti-strep antibodies, um, sticking onto strep antigen, getting stuck in the kidneys, neutrophils coming in, attacking and causing kidney damage. And complement as well. Um, all right, so that's that. Type four hypersensitivities. These are T cell related ones. So here we are talking about the uh, cell mediated immunities. These take two to three days after. You can even, believe it or not, probably, honestly, if you do go out, it's your very first time you've never seen a poison ivy in your entire life. You're just, you know, a naive little babe. And you go out into the woods and you roll around in some poison ivy and your body's never seen it before. It's going to take a long time for your body to build up immunity to that poison ivy the first time. So the first time you're exposed to it, you might not have a reaction. But that second time, well, a couple of days after the second time, you're going to have this type of hypersensitivity. Now, why does it take a couple of days? I, and I tell you this, tuberculin reaction or poison ivy or even, this is the, this is the problem that I have explained to you guys with organ donation. So it's the same exact thing that's going to happen when we reject an organ. Um, but why does it take a couple of days? It's one thing to activate some memory plasma cells and they just start cranking out antibody right away, right? That's fine. Antibody can get cranked out by even one cell. But in order to have an effective T cell response, one memory cell isn't going to cut it. So you still have to multiply out. It's going to take less time than the initial reaction, but it's always going to take time and to get them to the location and everything like that. So that's why it takes a couple of days. Okay. Anyways, um, why would it be important to test for tuberculin reaction um, with regards to T cell immunity? This is easy. I mean, it's easy when you think about it anyways, but um, tuberculosis, that bacteria hides out in the actual cells of your, like you're in your macrophages, in your lungs, so inside of cells. So because that is an, anti that's an antigen essentially coming from inside of the cell, that's going to be MHC1 from inside, right? And that's going to trigger the cytotoxic T cell pathway preferentially. So that's why they test for it that way. Um, they want to see if you had any T cell response. Have you had uh, this bacteria inside of your cells? Has your body reacted to it that way? And so that's why it takes a couple of days. So the false positives usually are caused by either somebody, that can be tricky, um, 
a lot of times it's because people have the vaccines. Because if you had the vaccines, especially if they've been from other countries, most other countries vaccinate for tuberculosis. So if you've been to, you are from another country and you go and you get this test done, you're going to test positive because you have a response to, you know, on purpose to tuberculosis, uh, even though you've never had it. So there's that, or it could be that you reacted to something that just gives a similar response that tuberculosis did. So it just, it, that can be a crapshoot on that case. Um, most of the time there was, had to be some sort of exposure to tuberculosis though, whether, um, uh, from a vaccine or um, having latent, a lot of times people don't know that they have latent tuberculosis. Um, but yeah, that's why they test you after that. If you test positive on that, um, they'll do the chest x-rays and everything like that. That's the most likely um, scenario would be to have the vaccine. <coughs> a lot of people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't know that they would test positive if they did that. Um, anyways. Other things, uh, contact dermatitis. This is poison ivy and poison oak. Also, um, haptins in jewelry and stuff like that. So we're talking about uh, the metals again. So this is another way that your body can react to the metals, uh, which we mentioned earlier. It just depends on how your body's seen it, how it was introduced to it. So what happens when we get contact dermatitis is we have these antigens, this chemical antigens, let's say poison ivy oil, okay? Um, your dendritic cell, which is like a macrophage of your skin, sees that, presents it to the T helper cell, which becomes Th1, because we're going to um, activate our cytotoxic T cell response. So this helps activate the macrophages and the cytotoxic T cells in the area, um, and they start killing any cell that has this bound on it. And then we have blisters forming as a result of fluid moving into the area from damage to the tissue and all that. A good time. All right, this is also how we would um, reject any grafts. So whether it's skin graft or whole organ grafts, it works the same way. Our MHC mark markers, remember how we had said every cell has MHC1. All of them do. Your cells have them, my cells have them, but your MHC1 looks different from my MHC1. So if I get your cells, my body sees your MHC1 completely by itself. It's not doing anything but it sees your MHC1 as presenting an antigen. That's what it looks like to my body. So it starts attacking you via the T cell pathway because it's MHC1, right? So that's how it sees it. But um, that's why you would reject. That's why we want that M your MHC to look as much like my MHC as possible. So it just looks like MHC that's not doing anything. It's just hanging out. All right. So we wanna get as much similarity as we can there. Um, it, it can go either way, though. That's the thing. So if we have host versus graft, which is what we would typically think of, um, we have our grafted kidney. This is a cell from the grafted kidney. Your normal MHC, which isn't doing anything. My T cell sees as bad, and then we're going to kill it and all that. So that's what we're just talking about. However, you can also have graft versus host. This is a unique kind of situation. If you get bone marrow, and the bone marrow isn't a match, which is another reason why you have to have bone marrow match. It's a little bit easier because they are stem cells, but still they have to match to a degree. These are lymphocytes and these lymphocytes can see my cells as foreign. So those lymphocytes can come out and start attacking their T cells from my bone marrow that I got, come attacking my cells in my body just like by itself. So that can happen in a graft versus host. So it's the flip side of it. It's really the only case, situation that you see that though. There's different kinds of grafts. You can get autograft. This is from yourself. We have isograft. This is from identical twins. Allografts. This is from other people. So if you're not an identical twin and you're not, it's not from yourself or an identical twin, it's an allograft. So my sister, if I got a kidney from her, that's an allograft because it's not identical. Okay. And then we have xenograft. This is from animals. We'll say animals, any other species. Um, typically, you're going to be thinking of like uh, cow valves or something like that, heart valves, pig heart valves, sort of stuff. All right. Um, where can your transplants come from? You might have live donors, recently de deceased donors, and fetal tissues. Now, how do we define <laughs> these, some of these things? Um, that's the problem, right? So whenever we have decided that a person is brain dead, 
and cannot be brought back. And there's all these papers that the uh, family would have to sign um, if we can find the family and everything like that, uh, saying that, yes, okay, this person can't be brought, brought back. It was not like the way that they would be themselves anymore, something like that. And um, so they would go ahead and, and put that person up for uh, donating tissue. That is like 99% of organ donation. Um, do we get, it was rare to have people donating to other people that were alive, like a person like me coming and donating to one of you guys, or like even to like their sisters or something like that. That was rare. We had a lot of people back out from that because it is a big deal. Like there is all sorts of screening, psychological screening. Are you being, you know, coerced into giving your kidney to this person? That is a big deal. And if there's any sign of any of that, then we will deny them to be able to trans, you know, to transfer their organ, whatever transplant. Um, okay, so the most of the organs are coming from brain dead individuals. So they are technically alive, they're on life support, their, their tissues are still alive, but their brains don't function anymore. So that kind of falls in between here, I feel like, in these areas. Um, whether we're talking about live donors or getting from kidney, like from your sister or something, recently deceased, you can actually get like cornea transplants from actual dead people, like from the morgue, um, and then of course fetal tissues. All right. Uh, all right, so this all brings up this concept, we, especially when we talk about the type three immunity um, issues, autoimmune diseases, and how all of these things can come into play with any of this. Are we attacking our own cells with T cells or antibodies or whatever it is? Um, either way, if you're attacking your own cells when you shouldn't be, that's gonna lead to autoimmune diseases. So we have hypersensitivity to yourself, and it could be all, any of these combinations of things that we've talked about. Uh, it could be systemically affected, or it could be an organ-specific issue. Um, like, uh, I don't know, MS, for example, because that's going to be like the myelin sheath. I can't ever say the word, right? I feel like I'm saying it like, I don't know, like it's the first time hearing it or something. But anyways, in MS, you're just attacking the coatings of neurons. And that is what leads to the symptoms, but that's not systemic, right? So that's the point there. You have Graves disease, Graves disease, you're attacking the thyroid. It seems like it's a systemic thing. You're having systemic effects, but it's not attacking you systemically. Um, you can have type one diabetes. That is, that is a um, autoimmune disease, by the way, for those of you that didn't know that. And these are some examples. A lot of this can be related to molecular mimicry. Like I had said with strep, it can have surface molecules that look like your own cells. This is the case with uh, what we believe certain infections like uh, measles and, and stuff like that. Uh, your body sees it, it creates antibodies that also happen to attack your own cells by accident. So that can be a problem. So that's molecular mimicry um, leading to rheumatic fever, psoriasis. Um, we think type one diabetes and MS might have be, been triggered by a viral infection. They think it was measles or like um, old, old measles infections from like, you know, a long, long time that was carried in your genes still and passed on. Um, but anyways, there's that. The uh, gut microbiome is going to be uh, playing a big part in making sure all this is kept in check, especially with autoimmune diseases. However, we eat a lot of crap. We have a lot of antibiotics. We don't go outside and get exposed to the outdoors and the microbes out there. Um, it's just crap. Like our, our microbiome is crap now because of the modern medicine. I mean, keep us in a bubble and we'll be fine. But, uh, you know, if we have to face anything in the real world, it can go wrong. And this is why. Anyways, this is just a look at um, lupus in general and having antibodies against a variety of organs. And then we have the inflammation in the capillaries under the skin, having the butterfly rash like what we're used to seeing with that. Whereas for rheumatoid arthritis, we have the buildup of the antibody complexes in the joints and that inflammation there can disfigure the joints and leads to um, you know, bony complexes forming and a, lo a lot of pain in those areas. Um, we kind of already mentioned Graves disease. Um, it can lead to overproduction of thyroxin and symptoms of hyper hyperthyroidism as we are attacking that um, gland. Type one diabetes. Uh, we're attacking the beta cells of the pancreas. So now we can't make um, insulin anymore as a result of, of that. So we can't utilize glucose properly. 
multiple sclerosis. No one wants to say about this. We're attacking the covering of the nerves. You often know, usually have symptoms earlier in adulthood, like young adulthood. Um, and we think this is associated possibly with human herpes virus six, this one. Okay, um, immunodeficiency diseases. Now this is the ones that are not. So we had the hypersensitivities leading up into our autoimmune diseases. Now we're moving into the immunodeficiencies. We're not reacting enough. They're not having what they need. Primary immunodeficiency present at birth. It's congenital. Um, and then secondary immunodeficiencies acquired after birth. Okay. So usually natural or artificial, but um, a lot of times we think of AIDS, the best example, right? You can have interruption in our creation of our uh, cell uh, protection pathways in our immunity at any point. So whether it is way early on uh, where you can't even make stem cells, or if it is where you are having a problem differentiating from the pre and uh, pre T and B cells, which is what X-linked SCID is. But um, no matter what it is, at any point you can start affecting this and any of those can have uh, results in, in certain kinds of infections. So if it's cell mediated, T cell related, if you lack that response, then you will have fungal, protozoa and viral infections and even cancers that shouldn't be there. Like we said, with sarcoma and stuff. Um, whereas if it's antibody related, you're gonna have a lot of bacterial infections since those are often fought outside. Um, but yes, okay, so A gamulo, A gamma globulinemia, you don't have the ability to make um, uh, antibodies, okay? But your T cells will be able to work normally. Uh, if you have a deficiency in T cell developments, um, you know, have opportunistic infections, wasting away, cancer, and these sorts of things, because this is the problem. It's usually more devastating to have a problem in your T cell line than in your B cell line because your T cell helper cells are required for activating your B cells. So it kind of you know, affects your whole system. That's why AIDS is so devastating. Now this is an example of abnormal development of the thymus leading to DeGeorge syndrome, which is gonna have a deficiency in the T cell response. Um, then we have SCID, which we already kind of brought up. They don't have uh, you know, working B cells or T cells, so they will have uh, severe issues and ability to fight any infection at all. Usually, you know that somebody is having problems with it within days of being born. Okay, so the secondary ones that you acquire somehow, it can be from infection. It can be from non-infectious, so that's like HIV, right? Non-infectious metabolic diseases, um, uh, chemotherapy and radiation, all these can lead to impairment of your immune function. So we know HIV is going to um, preferentially infect our T helper cells. And um, then that's going to cause all sorts of dysfunction in the T cells, but also because we need T helpers to activate B cells, we have problems there too. You can easily die from that. Cancers, if we have cancers of your actual lymphoid system, then you're gonna have issues of your you know, um, immune system working. So leukemia, plasma cell tumors, and thymus tumors are examples of these. All right, so that is that for this chapter. The question for the end of chapter 17, how are type one, two, and three hypersensitivities similar and how are they different? So that's what the one we're gonna leave it with there.